Well, good morning. It's good to be with you all. Let's uh, just have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for the fact that you are and that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. We thank you, Lord, that you cannot lie. We thank you that your word is truth. And this morning we ask you, Father, to continue to bless the, the word of God to our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would touch each of us with your loving presence. Lord, that you would speak your truth into each of our hearts, that today would be a day of uh, grace. And we know that that can only come from you. So I pray, Lord, that let my words be full of grace and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, I'd like to speak a message today. Um, kind of a message, uh, hopefully it's a message that's pertinent to our, all of our lives with what we're going through right now. Um, none of us imagine that we would be sitting here today or you sitting in your living room watching church. Uh, none of us would have probably thought of that weeks or months ago, but here we are. And I'd like to try to uh, help us to get a perspective, God's perspective on how we should think about this. How do you view this coronavirus situation? How do you process it? The title that I gave for the message is For Such a Time as This. And uh, probably you all recognize that as a familiar verse. It comes from the book of Esther. You remember the story where uh, Esther, the Jewess, was made queen in, I think it was Persia, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there was a decree given that all the Jews would be killed on a certain day. And her uncle, Mordecai, came to her in the palace and he said those words to her. Esther, basically he said, Esther, God has put you here for such a time as this. And uh, I guess you could say it was one of these times of decisions, this if. What, what are you going to do about it? I believe God would have us to have that attitude, us as his people today, that he has put us here where we are for such a time as this. That this, this is not an accident. This is not something that, uh, that someone is doing to us. We are not victims of a virus we are not victims of uh, some conspiracy, but we are here by God's appointment. We are here by God's appointment. God is the one who's in control. He's the one who's on the throne. And yes, there are circumstances and things that have causes uh, and so forth, but I believe as Christians, our perspective should be, we are looking at God. We're saying, Lord, what are you doing? And I believe as we look around, we can say that God is up to something big. Amen? Amen. He's up to something global. God is getting the attention of this world. He's trying to. And so that sounds pretty exciting. And it sounds like an opportunity, like we heard about in that children's lesson. So, you know, how do you feel? Do you feel like a victim? Or do you feel like this is a calling from God? You know, during this time, there's a lot of these conspiracy theories that come out of people that uh, it's this, that, or the other thing is plotting to take over the world. The, uh, may maybe it's the bankers. They're, they're working behind the scenes. They're going to take everybody's money from them and, and uh, redistribute all the wealth. Or maybe it's the communists. It's a, it's a, the communists, have, uh, or it's a plot. They've unleashed uh, warfare 
biological warfare on the world. Or maybe it's the Pope or the Mafia. Maybe it's the Democrats. Or maybe it's those vaccination people. Uh, maybe it's the Republicans, too. Um, you know, when I, when I read any of those things or I think about them, I have trouble having peace in my heart because I feel like a victim. But when I meditate on the fact that my God is in control, then it doesn't matter how many people are plotting. It doesn't matter what they're planning because my life is not, a, uh, is not under them. My life is under God. And that's how I believe he'd have us to live. Uh, you know, th this... Um, I saw in the news one of these uh, fellows, preachers, who's keeping his church open. He, the reason given by him was that um, this is all political. And I had to think, you know, that, that just to me spoke to me why Christians and politics really don't mix real well. It skews your view. Is it all a political thing that 600 people died in New York City the other day? What, was that political? What does that have to do with politics? That's a disease. That's a dangerous disease. But, uh, you know, if, if we get all wrapped up in the political world, we start thinking about those terms and excuse our thinking so much so that we actually can be a bad testimony. We can be a terrible testimony to the world who's looking on, instead of what God's calling us to be, which is a beautiful testimony of his perspective. We are here by God's appointment. God is doing something global. God's up to something big. In fact, I don't know that I've ever seen anything this big in my life. There's been a few things here and there, but this is probably the biggest I've ever seen. It's a global thing. And uh, that's a little scary at times, I have to admit. You know, it's not wrong to feel fear. It's wrong to give in to fear. It's wrong to let fear rule your life to now I'm making decisions based on fear. That's what we can't do. Well, why are there tragedies like this in the world? Why, why are there these difficult things? Well, I don't pretend to know all the reasons, and I'm not even going to try to answer that. But I do know this, that God uses these things throughout history. If you study history, you would see that in times of difficulty, God has brought many revivals to this world. Uh, through the Civil War, through different other wars, through... Um, famines and pl other places and so forth, pestilences like we're having now, I, I think we can call it that. Um, you can trace some great revivals. And why is that? It's because when, when our props of safety and security are all taken away from us, we start looking up. We start saying, are you there, God? Can you help me? I can't find any help here. And I believe that's one of the ways we need to look at what's happening right now. This is God doing something, drawing people to himself. And uh, the unbelieving person would say, God is cruel. Why does he allow these bad things to happen? But by faith, we say, no, God is merciful. Amen. Because if none of these things would happen, people would just go on their way happily to hell. But when things like this start coming into the world, people actually stop. They think, they, they uh, say they consider that there must be something else, or at least I hope there is, you know, from their, their perspective. And people start turning to God. How many of us turned to God when everything in our life was just going great? I didn't. When I turned to God was when everything in my life I felt like was terrible. And that's when I started looking up and saying, God, are you there? Is there a God? I started reading his word and I started crying out to him. Yes. And praise God, there's a promise that says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Amen. And I believe there's gonna be multitudes around the world calling upon the name of the Lord 
and they're going to be saved. And so this is a wonderful opportunity. God is merciful. He could just end history in one uh, you know, ex- implosion or explosion. And uh, I guess someday that's gonna happen when everything's rolled up and it's all over. But right now he hasn't done that. But he sent these, these uh, mercy drops, I guess you'd call them. He sent these, these, uh, this coronavirus as a wake up, as a shake up saying, come, come people, come to me, come. It's God's will that everybody on this, in this world would have that attitude. What would happen if every world leader would say, this is too much for me, I just can't handle it. You know, our hospitals are, be, are overflowing. Uh, the, the economy's going down the tubes. This is too much. And would just cry out to God and say, oh God, I need your help. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Yes. We know that's not gonna happen, but what if? That would be God's will, wouldn't it? That every leader, every person, every father, mother, child would take this opportunity and say, oh God, we need you, Lord. I just had an enjoyment imagining that scene yesterday, even though I know it's not gonna happen like that. But everybody in the whole world falling down on their faces, crying out to God. And I, I knew in my heart, I said, you know what, if that would happen, God would come through. God would answer that prayer. I thought about it yesterday, you know, some years ago there was a a governor down in uh, Georgia, Sonny Perdue. They had a a drought and they were getting very serious. Their water level was way down in their, their lake. And this governor had the audacity to call for a day of prayer on the Capitol steps. And I, I wanted to find out how it turned out, you know. I, I remembered that event and I sort of has been, that was 13 years ago. So I looked it up in the news, you know, to try to figure out what did happen after that. Well, when he did that prayer, everybody mocked him. Well, no, the unbelievers mocked him. There were Christians there who stood with him and who prayed, actually. He humbled himself on the steps of the Capitol. But there were the uh, Free Thinker Society was there with their signs saying things like, uh, all hail King Priest uh, Purdue." And uh, keep your prayers on the church steps, not the capital steps, and mocking, mocking. But that, that man, and I don't know anything about him other than this, but he humbled himself and he prayed. And he said, God, we have sinned. We have not done all we should, even with this water thing that they had made mistakes and so forth. But he said, God, would you please hear our cry and restore our water situation? It, it rained a little bit two days, I think it was a day later after that. And uh, it didn't happen in an instantaneous way, but over the months following, things returned to their normal level. And that's where they basically have been since then. Was that just an accident? Or did God see somebody on earth who humbled himself and God said, we're gonna do something about that. We're not gonna let that go unnoticed. Yes, God is looking, his eyes are looking to and fro throughout all the earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose hearts are turned toward him. That's a wonderful promise. Well, we gotta keep moving here. Um, We are here by God's appointment. We, meaning the earth, everybody on it, and God's church. It's God's appointment to us to be here where we're at. Let's look at the children of Israel. Um, turn to Exodus chapter 12 with me. What I want to do is look at the children of Israel and I want to learn some lessons from them. The other thing God is doing, he's bringing people to himself through this, but he also is bringing his people to a place of purification, taking away the distraction, taking away the things that would hinder us. And he's, he's wanting to use us to demonstrate to the world around us who he is. That's what he wants to do in us, his people. But let's look at the example of the Israelites. And I want you to notice something here. In everything that we look at, they were in the perfect will of God. There was no doubt about it. And God led them into some very difficult situations. So does God still do that? That's you know, what we want to look at. Yes, he does. He's led us all into a difficult situation right now. 
Exodus. God said he was going to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. He could have done it a lot of different ways, but he did it in a way that totally exposed the bankruptness of, of Egypt, the world superpower of the time, that totally uh, judged the gods of Egypt. He said in Exodus 12, 12, he said, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. And if you would trace all the plagues, you would see that they corresponded to uh, some of the gods that the Egyptians worshiped. And God said, I'm gonna demonstrate that to all these people, again, think about that mercy of God. In my mercy, I'm gonna show them that they're gods that they trust in, they're not God, that I'm the true God. And you know, there was a bunch of Egyptians who left with the children of Israel when that thing was all over, that mixed multitude. There were a bunch of them who left because they said, there's no God like that one. So they, God did these miracles he did the miracles of the frogs, the lice, the water turning into blood, the, the hail, and uh, you know, the locusts, and on and on. And finally, the, the, the last one where he took all the firstborn. And for the last, I forget how many it is, four or five maybe plagues, none of them touched the Israelites. They were all upon the Egyptians. And where the Israelites lived, none of them touched them. Those people knew that God had called them to something special. And they were told, we're gonna to bring you out of here and we're gonna take you to a wonderful promised land. Now let's look at uh, chapter 13 and verse 17. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, after all the firstborn died, Pharaoh finally gave in then. He let them all go and as it says, they went out with a high hand. They didn't just let them go, they gave them all their jewels, their gold and treasures. That had to be God. So it says that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines. Verse 18, but God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. God led them to the Red Sea. And look what it says in, in verse 21. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So God said, I'm gonna make it absolutely clear that I am leading you every step of the way. You're gonna know it, because there's gonna be a cloud here in the daytime, and there's gonna be fire at night. Wasn't that a wonderful thing for God to do? He wanted these people to know, this isn't just Moses' thing, you know, I'm telling you where to go. And just quickly, if we turn over to Numbers chapter nine, I think it is, it, it talks about this uh, further. In verse 15 it says, and on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony at even, there was upon the tabernacle as it was the appearance of fire until the morning. And it says in 16, so it was always, the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then the children of Israel journeyed. And then uh, when the cloud um, tarried long, in verse 19, the, the many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and journeyed not. And so it was when the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, they stayed a few days, and when the cloud lifted up, they went. And uh, what a wonderful thing. Wouldn't you love to have that kind of guidance from the Lord? Guess what, he's given us something better. He's given us his spirit. Amen. As many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Amen. He's given us his spirit inside our heart. Now here's the thing, when God is leading you, you don't get to pick when the cloud lifts and when it stays. And uh, it says in verse 22, whether it were two days or a month or a year, the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle, remaining thereon, the children of Israel did what you know, the Lord said. That's the one thing when God's leading you, you don't get to pick it. You just have to go with how he's leading you. And you know, today uh, with this coronavirus, we don't get to pick it. We got to follow the cloud with what he's leading us to do. What I'd like us to see is that the children of Israel didn't do really well. They didn't believe that God was with them. And they, they chafed against it. Let's look at uh, chapter 14 now. 
So he, he leads them uh, to the Red Sea. He led them there. It was clear. But what did the people say? He brought us here to kill us. He brought us here to kill us. Faith would have said what? Okay, God brought us to an impossible place right now. He must be getting ready to do something great. Wow, how's he going to get us out of this one? That would have been faith. Well, God in mercy did get him out of it. He, he uh, you know, dried up that Red Sea, brought him to the other side. They all praised God. They were all excited. But it didn't take too long after that. If you look in uh, verse, uh, let's see here. Yeah, chapter 15, they came to Mara again. How did they get there? The cloud and the fire brought them there. They came to a place, Mara, and they could not drink the water because it was bitter. And the people murmured against Moses saying, what are we gonna drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and God showed him to throw a stick in and he made the water sweet. See, faith would have said, God brought us to a place where there's bitter water. What is he going to do now? How's he going to get us out of this one? This is exciting. They didn't do too well on that test. All right, they keep going here. Chapter 16, the whole congregation, uh, they took their journey into the wilderness of sin, it's called. How did they get there? The pillar of fire and cloud. God brought them right there and says in verse 2, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness and they said to them, would to God we died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full for you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. There it is, a conspiracy theory. Aaron and Moses are doing a conspiracy. They brought us out here to kill us. No, God brought you there. And why did God bring you there? He wanted to demonstrate another miracle for you. He brought you to a place that was absolutely impossible. There's no food. What are we going to do? Again, what would faith have said? God, here we are again. Wow. You know, you brought us to another place like this. There's no, there's no food. How are you going to feed all these people, Lord? This is going to be exciting. No, they, they, they got carried into a conspiracy theory. And they got into unbelief. And God in his mercy still gave them what they needed. He said, I'm going to give you manna. And it's going to be a sign for me every single day, except for Sunday, uh, Saturdays. You're going to get up and you're going to go out and there's going to be food sitting on the ground for you. And you're going to know that I'm God. Let's keep moving on here. God leads them now to a place in chapter 17. All the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord. And they pitched in Rephidim. Okay, how did they get to Rephidim? The pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, right? That's how they got there. They knew that. And they pitched in Rephidim and there was no water for the people to drink. And the people all said... This is great, Moses. God's going to do another miracle for us. He's brought us into another impossible situation. That's not what's in your Bible? Okay, no. It says the people chode, did chide with Moses, and they said, give us water that we may drink. They're not even thinking about God. Moses, you give us water. And Moses said to them, why do you chide with me? Where do you, why for do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted, there for water and the people murmured against Moses and said why is this that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst they were in the center of God's will and they faced impossible situation time after time and what I'd like us to think about this morning is we are in the center of God's will right now if you're a servant of his. You're not a victim of some conspiracy. 
You are not a victim of a mysterious virus lurking in the shadows and darkness. You are right in the center of God's will for your life. And guess what? We're in some impossible situations. So what does God want us, the attitude that God wants us to have? Lord, you must want to show yourself strong. You must have something that you're wanting to do on the earth right now because this is global. This is global, Lord. You're doing something on a global scale. And I believe that faith says God has something up his sleeve, so to speak. He's got something he's wanting to do through his people who are called by his name in this hour. And he has us all over the world in all these places scattered. And the, the, the faith response is, okay, Lord, this is a tough one. This is really hard. I didn't ask for this, Lord, but by faith, I believe you have brought me here for a purpose, for such a time as this. God does lead his people, and this is not just coronavirus. One of God's ways is to lead us into impossibilities throughout our lives. Why? So that he can show himself strong. He purposely did that. Why did God take them to a place where there was no water? He could have done differently. He could have taken them to a place where there was food waiting for them. He brought them to places that were dry, that were empty of food, that were difficult, where there was no way out. That's God's way. And by faith, we say, okay, Lord, here we are again. This is another tough one. What are you, what are you gonna do? I mean, we've got to do this in ministry all the time, right, Aaron? You get into impossibilities. Right. And you just, all you can say is, Lord, we need you, God. You must have something you can do here to help this situation because it's impossible for me. No, God wants to reveal himself through that stuff. And then finally, he brought them to the land of the giants. Why? So that they would die there? So they'd get trampled on, beat up by all these big dudes that were way bigger than them? No, he brought them there so he would show himself strong and he would take care of those enemies and he would bring them into that land. You know, what would have been, think of the difference if those spies would have stopped right there when they came back, before they, before they got into all the hubbub and all this um, unbelief. What if they would have all stopped and said, hey, look, guys, what we want to do before we tell you about the land, what we want to do is uh, we all want to thank the Lord for what he's done so far, and we all want to remember this, okay? Who wants to tell the story about the, uh, the water from the rock? Anybody? I'll tell it. Great. Okay, that guy shares that story. All right, who wants to tell the story about the manna and the quails? Super, you tell that one. Nice and loud so everybody can hear it. Who wants to tell the story about the Red Sea parting? Okay, you do that. Who wants to tell about the 10 plagues? Let me have 10 hands. You, all right, you do that one, that one, that one, that one. What if they all would have stopped and would have rehearsed everything that God would have done up to that point? Can you imagine the same result? Can you imagine that the result would have been the same? They all would have said, oh, the giants, they're bigger than us. They're gonna kill us. We don't stand a chance. We're like grasshoppers. I say, no way. And therein is a key that I want to bring out in this message today. It's a time to remember what God has done in your life. Yeah. What has the Lord done hitherto? How did God save you? How did God deliver you from the bondages of your life? And in doing that, that is going to undergird our life and our faith, build up our faith to where we can stand in this day. Yes, Lord, I know you're great. I know you're mighty. I have this testimony right here. I have this thing you did in my life five years ago and 10 years ago and last week and this week. I believe that thank, a grateful heart is how to avoid a victim mentality. One of the greatest things we can do is to be thankful. Victims aren't thankful people. Victims are people who are blaming other people. It's the government's fault. They should have had more ventilators. It's the, the, the CDC, they should have noticed that this thing was coming. You know, it's the, this or that or the other thing. No, a thankful heart keeps us from being a victim. It points a finger. The victim points a finger and the victim isn't grateful. And I say God doesn't want us acting like a bunch of victims during this time. He wants a bunch of victors who are walking by faith, who are remembering his faithfulness and who are choosing not to blame others, not to get caught up in, in conspiracies and all this, 
but to say, Lord, we know you're going to do some great things. Wow, just show me what to do. Just show me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. To embrace a thankful attitude. That's 1 Thessalonians 5. Remember, it says, in everything, give thanks. And I've been trying to do that. Uh, I have room I can grow in. But let's choose to embrace a grateful heart. Let's choose to rehearse what God has done in our families. That'd be a great thing to do today if you're there at home. Rehearse some of the great things you've seen God do in your life and in our church. And then filter whatever's happening today through that grid work. You know what? It's going to look a lot more, uh, it's going to look a lot less imposing, a lot less impossible, because we have a God who's on the the throne, and he does impossible things for his people. So, all right, I'm wrapping it up here. We have an opportunity here. We have an opportunity to humble ourselves, to pray. We have an opportunity to see an ingathering of souls into the kingdom of God. We have an opportunity to build family ties like we haven't had before. Let's use that. We have an opportunity to learn to use tech for the glory of God and to show the world how a Christian handles adversity. God's looking for people who will sign up for that one. Lord, I want to take advantage of your opportunities. There's also dangers. We can let fear get a hold of us. We can waste precious time. We can become more addicted to tech. So we need to walk with the Lord. But I just want to encourage all of us, God is faithful, and he wants to show himself strong in your life and mine. So let's take that faith response. You know, the children of Israel, it says the things that they did were there for our learning. God put them there so we could learn from them. It's real easy to criticize what they did, but you know what, we face it just as much. The temptation to unbelief, to murmur, to doubt. So God bless you all, and we're for you, we're praying for you, and we love you. Enjoyed seeing many of your faces on uh, Friday. Uh, night, even though there were little tiny things on my computer, it was still a blessing. Let's, let's let God be glorified through this time. Amen.